Good morning, everybody. This is Mrs. Marburger back with the Read Aloud Packs. We are up to Chapter 8. Chapter 7 left off with Packs leaving with um, Gray, who was a dominant fox. They named him Gray because he was older and he had gray in his fur. But they have decided that they are going to travel together south to try to make it. Pax wants to try to make it back to his home where he came from. And he's going to wait for his humans there. Chapter 8 is back to Peter and what's happening in his part of the story. The sound Peter most loved in the world, the leather-to-leather -leather smack of a ball in a glove, was so real in his dream that he smiled as he opened his eyes, and then yelped in shock. A woman stood over him, tossing a baseball into a glove. She wore patched overalls with faded bandanas knotted along the straps, and her hair was a spiked mess that shook as she cocked her head to study him. He scrambled backwards along the rough wooden floorboards, crying out again, this time at the pain shooting up from his right foot. It all came back fast. In rising panic, he looked around for his pack, and there it was behind the woman, its contents strewn along the floor. She came closer and thumped the ball into the glove a little harder. His ball and his glove, Peter realized. The ball that had been in his pack, the glove that he had been sleeping on. He strained up, hey, that's my stuff. What are you doing here? At that, the woman threw back her head and barked something between a laugh and a snort. She pitched the ball and glove away and crouched down to eye him, one hand wrapped around a clutch of feathers she wore on a rawhide stripe around her neck. This close, Peter could see that she wasn't as old as he had thought. Not much older than his father, anyway. A single gray streak folded through her hair, but her skin was smooth. When she narrowed her eyes and snapped her fingers at his face, it dawned on him that the woman might be crazy. No, 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 no. This is my barn that you broke into. So what are you doing here? Would be my question. Peter scooted back. Crazy or not, the woman standing over him had a wall full of hatchets behind her, and he was one foot short of a running pair. Okay, right. I hurt my foot last night. I'd passed your barn, and I had needed a place to stay. So, look, I'll go. Not so fast. What do you mean you passed my barn? This is private property, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. The woman straightened to her full height, and Peter edged back even farther. I, I was taking a shortcut home from the practice he had been to the day before flashed before him. He nodded to his ball and glove from batting practice. You were coming home through my land from batting practice? Then the first thing I'm wondering is why don't you have a bat? She tossed a hand toward his stuff. Why are you carrying a roll of duct tape, garbage bags, and a charm bracelet, clothing, food, and water, but no bat, huh? The way she said it, was silly and stretched out like two syllables. It made him realize that she had the hint of an accent, but only a hint, as if sometime in her childhood, people around her had spoken a language that was close to singing. Well, I, I left it. The bat's too heavy to carry around. The woman shook her head again, and this time she looked disgusted. She yanked up the left leg of her overalls. Below the knee, her leg was a rough, wooden post. She stabbed it down beside Peter. Now, this leg, oh, this leg is heavy, boy. Solid heart pine. But I carry it around, don't I? The woman peered down at it and it seemed and seemed to discover something she didn't much like. She pulled a knife from her belt and, with a flick of her wrist, shaved off a chink from just above where her ankle would have been. Then she straightened her face. Peter again, the knife jabbing directly at him. So let's try this one more time because I'm very curious now. If you were at batting practice, how is it that you don't have a bat? Peter dragged his gaze up to the woman's face and then back down to the knife. The blade gleamed long and thin with an evil looking curve to it. She probably was crazy, all right. Probably worse. Her 
heart stuttered, his heart stuttered in his chest, and his mouth was a desert, but he managed to answer, I don't own one. The woman flashed half a grin and quick winked. Better. Yes, that has the feel to truth. So what's your name? Peter told her. So, no bat, Peter. What's this about your foot? Peter kept his eye on the knife as he peeled the sweatshirt from his foot. The pain of just that slight movement shocked him. Shudders ran through him, and for the first time he realized how cold he was. They twisted it. The woman crouched down, her wooden leg angled out awkwardly. Peter looked away. Don't move. Before he could even register what was happening, the woman slipped the cool blade of her knife inside his sock and, with a quick stroke, slid it open. He pressed his lips together to keep from crying out. His foot was as dark and swollen as an eggplant. Wow, that gives you a great visual, doesn't it? We all know what an eggplant looks like, a dark purple, and we know how it kind of has like a swollen appearance. It's skinnier up top and then it swells out. You walked on this? Peter pointed to the branch beside him. I broke this off and I made a cane. His finger was shaking. He dropped his hand. The woman nodded again, then cupped her hands around his heel. I'm going to move this around, she said. You ready? No, don't touch it. But the woman began to probe his foot, calling commands. Now move your big toe. Now move all of them. And the foot, side to side. Peter winced at the pain, but he did everything she asked. You're lucky, she said, setting Peter's foot down onto his sweatshirt. A non-displaced fracture of the fifth metatarsal. That's a single clean break in the outermost bone of the foot. Lucky? How is a broken bone lucky? The woman reared back, slammed her wooden leg down near his hand, and then stabbed her blade into the wood. Oh, I don't know. Let's see. How is only a broken bone lucky? Okay, okay, I get it. Sorry. She tugged the knife from her leg and pointed at him. You're young. You'll be in a cast for mm, maybe six weeks. You'll heal fine. How do you know this stuff? Are you a doctor or something? I was a medic in another life. The woman hoisted herself up and looked down at Peter as if she had just put it together. A runaway. She crossed her arms over her chest and cocked her head at him. Yes. You're running away? No, no, I was just out hiking. She clapped her hands to her ears and frowned. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. My lie detector was going off, so why don't you try again? Are you running away from home? Peter sighed. Not exactly. Well, then what exactly were you doing last night, passing through my land with your extra clothes and your supplies, no bat Peter? Well, I'm not running away from home. I'm running to home. Well, that's a twist. Continue. Peter looked out the window over the workbench. Tall pines pierced a pale morning sky, and a bunch of crows argued noisily at the top of their branches. If there were a story he could tell that would get him out of this barn and back on the road to Pax, he would tell it. He would disappear into that day, fractured fifth metatarsal and all. But if such a story existed, he couldn't think of what it was. He slumped against the wall. The war, it's heading for our town. They'll take the river. My dad had to go serve. My mom died, so it's just us. So he brought me. Uh, how old is your father of yours? What? He's 36. Why? Then he didn't have to do anything. If there's a draft, it's for 18 to 20, 20 year olds. Still, kids, easy to brainwash. So if your father went, he volunteered. It was his choice. So let's start this story off with the truth. That's the rule around here. Okay, sure, he chose to go. And he brought me to my grandfather's. And, and you didn't like it there? And that wasn't it. It was, um, could you put that, what, could you put that away? The woman looked down and seemed surprised to find the knife in her hand. Oh, such bad manners, Lola, she chided herself. We have forgotten how to behave with a guest. She tossed the knife onto the workbench. Go on. So we just found out her name, Vola. 
Okay, well, I had a fox. I mean, I have a fox. And we turned him loose. We left him on the side of the road. My dad said we had to, but I should have never done that. Since the instant they had been driven away, Peter had been tormented by the, by the things he should have said to his father. They all came rushing out now. I raised him from a kit. He trusted me. He won't know how to survive outside. It doesn't matter that he's just a fox. That's what my father had called him, just a fox, as if he's not as good as a dog or something. Yes, yes, so you were plenty angry, so you ran. Well, I wasn't angry. I'm not. It's that my fox, he depends on me. So I'm going back and I'm going to get him. Well, now, now you're not. Change of plans. No, I have to get him and I have to take him home. Peter rolled to his knees, swallowing the gasp of pain that shot from his foot. He grabbed the branch and he tried his weight on it for a second. And then he sank back down, exhausted from just that. Now... You still think this? How far away did you leave him? Two hundred miles, maybe more, Peter admitted. Vola snorted. You wouldn't make it two miles now. You'd be nothing but bear bait out there. That is, if you didn't die of hypothermia the first night. You won't be able to move enough to keep warm. She leaned back against the workbench, winding a scarf around a finger, and Peter could tell she was trying to figure something out. She didn't look as crazy now, just deep in thought, and maybe worried. Then she seemed to come to a decision. Someone is bound to come looking for you, and I can't have that. I need you gone. But I can't send you out like this. I have enough on my conscience. I will bind that foot and give you something for pain, something that's legal to give to a child, and then... I'm not a child. I'm almost 13. Bola shrugged. And then you will leave. There's a garage not far down the highway. Call this grandfather of yours and have him come get you. I'm not going back. I'm going to get my fox. Not like this, you're not. You cannot bear weight on that broken foot until the bone heals. Six weeks at least. Maybe you try then again. Six weeks? No, that would be way too late. My fox. Now remember, boy, I know a little something about traveling on one leg. To get around before that bone heals, you would have to learn how to carry yourself from your shoulders and your arms, and you'd have to become strong in new ways. Almost impossible for an adult, never mind a child. I'm not a child. Bola swept up a silencing hand. So, you will go back now and have that broken bone set, but first I will bind it for you and fix you something better than that branch to walk with. Bola pushed herself off the workbench and left the barn. Peter watched her disappear down a pine-framed path, rolling with a limp so deep that it looked painful. Then he crawled across the floor and stuffed his belongings back into his pack. He pulled himself up to the workbench. The effort made him dizzy, and he had to white-knuckle the wood until his head cleared. His foot throbbed fiercely when he was upright and by testing it slightly, he knew he wasn't going to be able to walk on it. Bola would bind it, though. He'd be able to walk on it then. He had to. He hoisted himself up onto the bench to wait. He hadn't been able to see much of the barn the night before, even with a flashlight. Now he took it in. The floor was swept bare, with bags of seed and fertilizer stacked neatly by the door. The place smelled of clean hay and wood and not of animals, although he could hear chickens nearby. The workbench took up the whole gable wall of the barn. It was lined with small tools and pieces of wood. Opposite, dark against the bright rectangle of the doorway beside it, draped burlap covered a bunch of things, draped burlap covered a bunch of things mounted on the wall. Another convulsion of shivers took him, and this time not from the cold. The covered mounds, were shaped like human heads. Any number of perfectly harmless things could be hanging on a barn wall, but what they really liked looked like were human heads. His throat went dry and his heart began to kick hard. He'd been stupid and careless. Probably the crazy woman was going to let him go. Well, why wouldn't she let him go? But maybe she wasn't. He found the knife she had left and wrapped his palm around its smooth grip. 
Fola had the upper hand in whatever was going to happen between them, but that didn't mean he couldn't defend himself. He slid the blade into his pocket just as she appeared in the doorway. Drink this. She handed Peter a mug and set a bowl beside him. Peter sniffed at the mug. Cider. There's a measure of willow bark in it, so drink it all. Willow bark? It's the aspirin in the wild. Peter put the mug down. He wasn't going to drink a crazy woman's brew. Suit yourself. Bola took up the bowl, began stirring the green paste inside with a finger. What's that? Poultice with ars ar arnica for the bruising and comfrey for the broken bone. She gestured for him to prop his foot up on the bench. I guess they were different herbs and medicines um, to help with his swelling foot. The poultice felt cool and soothing as she eased it over the hot, tight skin. She untied a bandana from her overall strap and wrapped it around his foot, binding it with a second scarf so that it felt secure. And then she straightened up, wiping her hands on her overalls. How tall are you? Five foot three, why? Bullet didn't answer. She rummaged through, rummaged through a sack, stack of lumber, brought several long, narrow pieces over to a pair of sawhorses, and began sawing them into paired lengths. The cut wood smelled fresh and clean, and as she nailed short boards across the top of the two longer ones, Peter understood. You know what she's making? Crutches. She was making him a pair of crutches. The knife he had stolen grew heavier across his thigh. In a few minutes, Vola had, ang Vola had angle braced the top boards and screwed on hand rests. She measured the crutches against him, then sawed an inch off the bottom of each. Then she rolled out an old tire from the corner of the barn. She went to her workbench. She scanned its length. Peter's cheeks burned as she turned to him. Did you take my knife? Her voice had turned dangerous, like something that could burst into flames and peel the roof off the barn. Peter felt dizzy and his heart began to thud again. He pulled the knife out and handed it to her. Why? Peter swallowed hard. His words were gone. Why? Because, okay, because I was afraid you might kill me. Kill you? She eyed him hard. What? Because I live out in the woods? That makes me a murderer? Peter raised a shoulder toward the wall of bladed tools. Oh, because of my tools? I have 20 acres of trees to care for, and I'm a woodcarver. You thought they were weapons? Peter looked away, ashamed. Look at me, boy. He turned back. Maybe you are not wrong, she said, locking his gaze. Maybe you see something. Maybe I am. She raised her hand slowly and pinched her fingers together in front of Peter's face then suddenly flicked them open. Boom! Dangerous like that. No warning. Peter flinched. No, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Vola shot a palm at him and spun away. She cut four strips of rubber from the tire, then wrapped them around the crutch tops and grips and secured them with twine and silence. She held the crutches out. Peter placed one under each arm and eased himself to the floor. It was an immediate comfort to be upright and balanced with his injured foot safely tucked up. Take your weight on your palms. Lift yourself. Don't hang. Plant the crutches, then swing through. Peter began to thank Vola, but Vola cut him off again. At the end of my road is the highway. Head left, and in a quarter of a mile, you'll come to a gas station. You figure it out from there. She helped him into his backpack and then turned away, picked up a block of wood, and began to shave off slices as if he were no longer even in the barn. Peter tried a step toward the door. He wobbled a little, but not much. That was a hop, Bola said without looking up. I said swing through. Now get out of here. For a moment, Peter didn't move. He didn't know where he was headed, only that it wasn't it sure wasn't back to his grandfather's. Vola turned and leaned toward him, pinched her fingers together, and shot them out at him again. Go while you're still safe. And that is the end of chapter eight. So I think that Peter offended Vola. Can you tell by 
Um, she was never super friendly to begin with, but I think at the end of the chapter, when she realized he was accusing her of being dangerous or trying to hurt him, when all she was really trying to do was help, I think she became offended and she was a little upset with him and she just wanted him out, wanted him gone. So now Peter's out on his own with a broken foot, heading to a gas station. Um, still don't know what he's going to do. What do you think he's going to do? Is he going to back to his grandfather's? I don't think so, but I don't know how he's going to get out of the situation either. Maybe you can make a prediction and we'll see if you're right. Um, okay, so next time will be chapter nine. Thanks for listening.